<laughs> See if this works. Whoa. Oh, good. Well, it's Halloween morn, everybody. The weekly Monday morning vlog podcast for the South Coast's longtime astronomy and telescope club, the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit, which just happens to be based up at Santa Barbara's beautiful Museum of Natural History in Mission Canyon. We call this the SBAU Astro Hour, and our members and space nuts who are not in the club that would like to get in the SBAU can watch us on YouTube, as well as um, past programs, some 87 actually. We welcome questions and comments down below. I'm your proud vice president up for re-election, along with the missing president this week. We'll talk about that in a minute. Ron Heron is my name. Our president, Jerry, is on special assignment. I'm going to introduce the movers and shakers of the astronomy unit, the astronomical unit. That means 93 million miles, actually, between us and the sun. You know, to just kick things around. Space news, recent NASA launches, SpaceX, discoveries, astrophysics. And this is episode number 88 for the um, last day of October, which, believe it or not, I guess uh, government is thinking about making that a Saturday holiday from now on because when it's Monday the kids have to go back to school on a the next morning in any event through the 6th of November let's meet the gang and I don't need this but I because I know everybody Jerry Wilson is the president uh -huh. he's not with us Chuck McPartland is on screen hello Chuck Outreach. good morning I want to get a update from you in a moment and maybe even something from Pat your wife who's the merchandise manager in case we want to sell some stuff, or actually, we're going to have some a presentation by her at our board meeting next weekend, I believe, or in two weeks on the 12th, we'll have our board meeting. Yes. And uh, got some changes in store. Uh, running the show for Jerry as our regular webmaster is Tom Totten, past president. Tom, thank you very much. You're going to be an integral part of this. Uh, also logging in is longtime member and uh, president of the Santa Barbara Theater Organ Society. But a definite telescope freak, freak, Bruce Murdoch, at the bottom of my screen. Bruce, wave at everybody. Hello. Okay. And next to him is our beloved former Westmont College instructor of science, Tom Whittemore. Morning. Retired to Big Bread, editor of our newsletter. You got my name, did you not, of uh, our next speaker, which is this coming Friday night, right? Rory Bentley. You made a crazy. Tell me that Tom is formerly loved, now he's beloved. <laughs> I'm not sure. I guess you're right. Well, the kids miss it. The kids, the uh, Westmont. No, you said our formerly beloved. Oh, I did. I say formal. I guess I did. Yeah, we don't love you anymore, Whittemore. I'm sorry. <laughs> We're just going to have a round robin because uh, we don't have a technically uh, long winded uh, from Astronomy Magazine, Jerry Wilson list of talking points. So Tom Totten volunteered to take over and run the program today. I'll be hosting and throwing a lot of questions out, getting some updates. Let's do the cartoons because these are sillies in the science realm that Jerry throws at us. Sends just okay. us. Ron, 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 this first one is the picture that your daughter sent to, just to talk about uh, what is a, uh, a bunch of penguins, uh, a pelicans called. And really? so let's get that on the screen here. Okay. Uh, so that, that photo. I didn't write a comment on, I'll just have to so you oh, see that? expand it so we can see them, see, make it larger. Well, let's see it, make it larger even, let's see if I can. Yeah. Right now they look like little ants. <laughs> no, so, like so, what, what, so what do they call it, Bruce? It, it, uh, Jerry said it was called a scoop. That's right, a scoop of pelicans. That wasn't Jerry, <laughs> that was Ron. Oh, Ron, okay. Well, that was my daughter. Uh, she yeah. actually took this picture up at Avila Beach, where they oh, live, yeah. near there in five cities. But it got me to thinking there's strange names. I don't know where they come from. You have a murder of crows that Tom Totten was feeding peanuts to this morning outside his house. If you miss the uh, Hitchcock movie, The Birds, you could go to his home and see it every day. <laughs> <laughs> and what was the one, uh, Chuck, you sent to us? Or no, it wasn't you. It was Tim Jim Trotter that said uh, a parliament of pigeons or something. Oh, parliament of owls, owls, I know. Owls, that's what it is. I believe there's a, 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 a exhibit at the museum about that. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so you guys have been up there. 
So, Ron, I, I think the reason I called a scoop of pelicans is because, you know, they're, they're be, their bills are such big scoops on them. So it's kind of a play on words there, maybe. I also saw that they're called a, a pod of pelicans. <coughs> oh. Or, or a pouch, a pouch of pelicans, rather. A pouch, yes. yeah. <laughs> that, that makes sense. And, and uh, Ron? Yes? When we were kids, my mom would always read us poetry, and she really liked Ogden Nash. Right. You Are you used to read us the one that goes, the funny bird is the pelican. Its beak can hold more than its belly can. <laughs> <laughs> we also wrote the uh, shortest poem ever written. Which is? Please. Adam had him. <laughs> <laughs> well, th this is science. We'll, we'll, we'll keep, skip that for now. What's this one here? So this is uh, it's a, yeah, something large, about... The large the Oreo. Oreo. So Oreo analyzing... Okay. They're analyzing an Oreo cookie somehow here, huh? Trying yeah. to split it so that there's the same amount of cream on each side. <laughs> Is that what the, they're uh, doing? You know, the, uh, the, the adhesive force between the filling and the cookie is probably a lot less than it is to shear the uh, filling itself. So it's going to have to stick into one of the, uh, the two sides of the cookie. Could you explain that further, Bruce? I didn't understand what you just said. Well, they put the goop on there, the frosting, right? In the middle, the white part. Right. They they take a cookie and they put a goop of that stuff, and then they put the other cookie and squash it. And the the uh, adhesion between the frosting and the cookie is a lot weaker than the shear force. What it takes in shear to be able to uh, split the uh, frosting. Frosting is strong with, with respect to the um, the adhesion to the cookie. So you know that every, every child in the world, including one side or the other, they don't okay. break in the middle. But we we always take them apart, don't we, and eat them half at a time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, then instead of having one cookie, you've got two cookies. Yeah. <laughs> and I know Chrissy has an activity for the school kids for moon phases, where they uh, open up an Oreo cookie and they take whatever side has the most cream on it. And then they sculpt it into the different phases. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she cooked one of our members. And down in the South, they have a thing called a moon pie. Yeah. Huge. Well, it's big. It's about that big. And, and th this was the Batman, uh, uh, what do you call it? The polynomial? What is this? Ba Batman logo right. formula? Right. I started to go and then actually. Uh, 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 program that to see if it came up what it was. It looks like there's a, it's only one equation, but it looks like that they have various, um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, areas that they, you know, there's breaks in the, in the Batman there. Well, I think it's the Batman. dots are between the equations. Uh-huh. Or isn't that multiplication? That means multiplication, no. I thought. No, because... I, I don't think so, because you've got to split it into multiple areas here to make those uh -huh. different. You can see there's gaps in the curves. Uh huh. But those two uh, formulas up above, those two equations. Well, give you, give it, you it is. Way? It does look like they made just one equation out of the whole thing, though. Wow. Equal zero. Equal yeah. Zero. OK. Oh, that's a strange one. Tell, tell me, any of you, Chuck, you could do that. Oh, my God. Here we go. This is the Bachelor of Science. <laughs> Either Alex, Alex. I didn't uh, get that the first time I saw it. OK. Uh, your Oscar or Felix. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> go shave, you idiot. That's me in my life at home. I had to shave today around the edges. OK. That's what one, else we got here? Uh, here's a Dilbert cartoon. How's your quantum oh, computer yeah. prototype coming along? And which one is Dilbert? Is he at the... Uh, Dilbert isn't in here. Head. That's Wally. Oh, neither of these guys is Dilbert, right? Neither That's one. Boss and Wally. Okay. It's in some strange office. Great. Well, the project exists in a simultaneous state of being both totally successful and not even started. Well, can I observe it? Well, that's a tricky question. Don't know. <laughs> no. Get them on board here. You know, Scott so, Adams is right on. You know, uh, a lot of us have worked in industry as, you know, in sci scientists and engineers, and you get managers that are clueless. And he'd really <laughs> like to capitalize on that. 
<laughs> it all takes place in the office. You suppose they're still in there with the pandemic? Here we have a couple aliens homebound. Wait, I bet this guy can point us towards Alpha Centauri. They are lost. <laughs> so the speed of light, it's another four and a third years to get there, but good luck. We saw this one last time. The real reason behind evolution, how it started, was a little problem between, um, I guess, <laughs> Alice and Ralph Cramden. <laughs> Don't walk away when I'm talking to you. And he decides, I've had it. I'm getting out of here. I'm going to go start animals on land. <laughs> All right. Okay. Is that it? Yes. That's for the cartoons that I got. Uh, yeah. So yeah. what what should we go for first here? Oh, uh, well, here's here's an interesting uh, shot of Jupiter done by an amateur. And it has a couple of the moons. Europa over here on the right and Ganymede on the left. And, and he points out that you can actually see some surface features on Ganymede. So that's a pretty, pretty amazing shot. And he's done it, did it with a uh, 300 uh, millimeter telescope. So that'd be 12 inches, right? Mm -hmm. Oops, and, oh, this comes up when you highlight yeah. that. And, uh, and then also, he, but he put on a 5X uh, power mate inch and a quarter so he, he's got he got up to what uh, he took a, a, a 2800 frames and 28 milliseconds each frames per second 25 focal length was 6000 with that 5x mm -hmm. power mate put on and uh, so uh, it doesn't show how he uh Put it together, but a lot of software involved, Photoshop and uh, Registax, Autostacker. So I just thought that was pre pretty interesting detail that he got on Jupiter. You can actually get... a, a Christopher Go, who is where where um, Edgar is right now in Cebu in the Philippines. Uh -huh. He does some fantastic Jupiter imaging. This you know, is this is a... elevation. He must be up high when he takes these. Because turbulence generally screws the images up. Oh, good, good question. I'm not sure where this guy was at. Oh, Queensland, Australia. Mike's Astro Shed, Queensland. Backyard. Data source backyard. <laughs> How come it's not colorful? Like, where are the colors? Well, Let's most see. of those colorful pictures are artificial color. Really? They highlighted it. They, they get amped up. Yeah, this is okay. this is more realistic. And this, you can tell he great, imaged great. over a fairly long period, it looks like, because it's really, it's kind of faded around the edges. And Jupiter rotates rapidly enough that if you if you look for a long time, the features are actually changing. This is a great, web, great website, this astrobin.com. All these amateurs put their uh, their images here and post them every day. And i oh, got to log in to see that. That's not the way I wanted to go. But uh, well, I just thought that was... Pretty outstanding that uh, what he could do. We all know that Jupiter turns uh, a full revolution in ten hours, and it's so big it could hold what three thousand Earths, thirteen hundred. Okay, thirteen a lot. It's really big. Does science know how fast it's turning at the equator at its own equator? Got to be. Oh, I'm sure there's a number there, and I don't know what it is, but it's different at different latitudes too. It's a gas giant. It's just like the sun. Sun doesn't have a single rotational period. Well, you could probably, knowing how science is, measure all those different levels. This one's going. Yeah, yeah you can see how fast the sunspots are moving, or how fast features are moving in the in the the bands on Jupiter. But our planet's going twenty four um, thousand miles in a day, and that's one thousand miles yeah, an yeah, hour. Yeah, thousand an hour. Well, that's really booking to go 10 hours god yeah I mean, why it's not fat and wide in the middle it, it, is. it is noticeably compressed it's it's, it's of so course what? you can say say that about our sun also yeah, yeah it's what 25 yeah. days to rotate at the equator and, and 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 this and this thing is what uh, 10 times the diameter of of, of jupiter sun? yeah 10 or 11 jupiters so to become so, a gas giant, obviously you got to be gas. To become a star, you got to be gas. Is it possible to have something totally rock 
like the smaller planets that size it isn't is it there is no well, they think saturn has a rocky core what does saturn well not no now they're thinking it's more diffuse Oh, okay. they, they found out with Jupiter that's a very diffuse core instead of being differentiated into a, like a molten nickel iron and silicate core and then um, you know, metallic hydrogen outside of that. What are we hearing? Somebody making Tim, your speaker is. Uh, is somebody's wife talking to you? I just, I, just, I just muted Tim. It's a lot of noise there. <laughs> We're being like, like, he's talking, trying to talk. Got a bright light in front of your face, also, Tim. So, uh, yeah, got the window behind you. That's what's going on. Yeah, First time, Jim Crawford, our telescope guy, main telescope guy, I guess. Is so, watch, watch your background noise, Tim. You have been eaten away by sunshine. <laughs> Not a bad thing. <laughs> nice of you to join us, Tim Crawford. Or at least he's, we're getting to the ceiling in his room. That's a good point. There's the fan. <laughs> oh, he's walking. Oh, now we're getting a tour of the house. <laughs> we're going to go to the bathroom with him any second now, guys. <laughs> we don't need that on video. No. That looks better. All right. Now I can, I can ask Tim to unmute himself and see if he comes through without any background noise. Do I get a bunch? There that looks, sounds better. Sounds good. I, I was just going to listen in today. That's all. I, just, I didn't realize that we're going to be a, like a Zoom meeting. Yep, you're in a Zoom meeting, Tim. All righty. Well, didn't Good. prepare for anyway, that. <laughs> so anyway, we're just doing Astro Bin there. Uh, what else? Oh, that uh, that uh, we should go to that. Uh, Bruce, you turned sideways on us. <laughs> I know. I I you're in a little window, and and my how do I get out of this? Just turn there. the lens. Ninety degrees. Turn your lens. <laughs> <laughs> turn the yeah. turn the cell phone. <laughs> turn the cell phone ninety degrees, and everything will be fine. There, there we go. go. <laughs> like the zoom. Nice we can talk. go to this. We can talk about the joint polar uh, survey uh, deal. See if we can what close that? that. And that's uh, this mission that's also going to show the inflatable heat shield. So let's see what this looks like. So I'm not sure why there's oh Mars because it's going to be trying to land on Mars with a heat shield. Okay, and who's sending this? NASA. United Launch Alliance with NASA, probably. Well, we're and doing a lot of, there it is. Doing a lot of stuff with ESA, uh, European. Haven't tied. We haven't tied up with uh, Japan yet, or India has a space program, believe it or not. So it's separated. We've done joint stuff oh. with Japan. Have we? Okay. Every twenty seconds. That's all. Collecting data. And so that's our delay. What, speed now what is it? What is this yellow thing? Eject. Oh, ejects a data recorder. Hmm. And this is about uh, going to gonna try it off the coast of Hawaii first, I guess. Well, that's where it's going to land, but it's going to go up with that launch from Vandenberg. This week right. or has it been delayed? It's been delayed. Again, OK. Till at least November 9th. They had a battery problem. Wow. This really? A, a lithium battery, right? <laughs> it was lofted. That would burn up. <laughs> lofted is their acronym there for the uh, low Earth orbital flight test of an inflatable decelerator. Very good. <laughs> so that falls 10 times. Yeah. Well, it's right there in the text. <laughs> okay. So those rings we saw that were strapped together were full of air? Yeah, or nitrogen or something, you know, but gas. Is it going to bounce on the surface of Mars? No. no it's just kind of like a, those balls that were all kind of put together. This is just an reason. attempt to make a rigid structure that's lighter than the solid ones they were sending so that they can try to send more instruments in, the, in whatever lander is going with it. Okay, they don't have a lander yet, though, and not a new rover going to Mars on it. I'm it sure they're working, on, they're working on several. It was supposed to go off at midnight, and then here's it mounts this delay here, Wednesday, mm. November 9th, next week. Oh, well, uh, speaking of delays, does anybody know anything about that moon uh, rocket that has been delayed endlessly? Artemis 1. Artemis, yeah. I haven't heard anything. Obviously, we haven't yeah. heard, so. They sure have had a lot of problems on that. Here, here's, here's a NASA screen. Uh, <laughs> they did 
where is Artemis here? Artemis on track. <laughs> oh. So it's just going to roll out. To, what's it say here? No earlier than Friday. Well, November 4th. That's pretty, that's pretty soon. And what's, but what about launchy though? Well, first mm -hmm. mission targeted for 12.01 a.m. EDT, it says up there. Friday, oh, wow. November 4th. Oh, fantastic. Oh. fantastic. I, that, that's, that makes it sound like they're going to roll it right out and launch it. But I think they, they're going to roll it out a little bit earlier. <laughs> <laughs> they ought to leave it where it is. Yeah. <laughs> is, there a, is there a window involved when it comes to the moon? Can you just launch any time you want? No, you've got you've got to have a window to. Yeah get where it's going to be okay one one out of 28 days <clears throat> during the well, they day probably have a little window it's i guess you could do the math couldn't you and see how many uh um what's the word i'm looking for degrees up in the sky it traverses in a day probably be several wouldn't it well 360 divided by 28 yeah okay well what do you get get more than 10 okay <laughs> Well, well, we'll we'll see it when it goes because it's it, this has had so many delays. I, it, well, I, I don't know. It's not coming out of here. Oh, you you. Uh, I'm sorry. I thought you meant we could observe it when it goes up. Well, no, this, no. This yeah. one's just going to go out. Or is it going to go to the moon and circle it and come back? Yeah. Artemis one, and then do you know the difference between Artemis two and Artemis three? I'm sure it's on their website. I, one I, may be one might be manned. What the third one? Well, the future one, of course, is going to be manned. Yeah, yeah. Because they had. Here we go. Of, one, two, and three. There were eight Apollos, or no, ten Apollos before eleven. Eight, eight is when we lost the three astronauts, right? I believe the one. Oh, the first one. Yep. What was eight? And then there was Apollo thirteen. That would have been eight. A, eight was, I think, the first one to go up in orbit. Oh, okay. That went out there actually. Orbited the moon. Yeah. And this rocket is bigger than the Saturn V. This Artemis oh, sucker. So their, their symbol they're using has all these character things. The uh, tip of the A points beyond the moon. And then they got the <laughs> moon. They got the trajectory and the blue earth. All right. Well, you remember growing up when anything NASA was doing was just one big project at a time? Either it was a Mercury program or the Gemini, and then it went into Apollo, and that was it. And then there was 20 years of the shuttle. Now we've got an orbit of the sun. We got DART. We got Lucy. Well, there was always lots of stuff going on. It's just that it wasn't publicized as much. Really? For us people sure. to not know that? You, people you had all the Lucy? Mariner missions, and you had Voyager and all those things going on at the same time. You had moon missions, and you had... Uh, that's true. You're right. Shuttle. That was all NASA. Yeah. <laughs> I had the V'ger. I wonder when that's going to be coming back like it was in that movie. <laughs> but I like this <laughs> Halloween sun. <laughs> like yeah, what? yeah, yeah. You like what? The Halloween sun image that was up there. Yeah, here we go. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Okay. We usually set up telescopes in our driveway for Halloween, but it looks like tonight is going to be a bust. <laughs> so I'm probably going to do a Halloween spooky images slideshow on the uh, on the garage door. Mm. Well, aren't most of you going to be manning the candy at the front door? Well, we do it in our driveway. Oh, you actually give the kids their... Or do you set up this telescope in the driveway? Usually, yeah. Oh, that, and that's your treat. Well, you we have candy, too. Oh, okay. <laughs> there you go. Look at. <laughs> I don't get that one. It's a, it must be something behind the witch and the Saturn there. <laughs> Strange but true. That's where they live. <laughs> so does anybody that, have anything else they want to bring up today? I hope we'll think about. Uh, I got an alert today from Consumers Reports, which I get a lot. <laughs> Warning of red dye number three in Halloween candies, a bunch of them. Oh, no. Years ago, that was taken out of cosmetics because it causes cancer, but they still uh, allow us to give it to our kids. The kids are more resilient. <laughs> <laughs> Normally, you eat it. Yeah, you eat candy. I guess you throw Might it in. 
Well, here, so it might be in smaller quantities in, in candy, but who knows? Yeah. So this was an interesting story about the insight detecting the uh, what an um, uh, asteroid hit on Mars, and that, then they actually found the, the, the place where it hit. And I, I couldn't believe how big it was, the hole that it made. And look at all the ice that it splashed out. Yeah, and that was near the equator, right? Yeah. Boulder-sized blocks of all water ice. Let's see if I can. You know, I saw this, and I didn't get it. Well, let's so take... here's, here's the crater made by an asteroid that hit Mars, and then underground there's chunks of ice that got thrown up and, and the scale of this would be something like in the order of uh, what a quarter mile across i think it was 500 feet across for the um, crater okay I can, right here 490 okay. feet that's yeah. my wow and then it said wow. somewhere like it, it threw stuff 23 miles oh my god so meteoroid uh, five to 12 meters or 16 to 39 feet would have burned up in Earth's atmosphere, but not in Mars. Well, I don't know about 39 feet totally burning up, but it probably wouldn't have hit as one mass. <laughs> oh, this Depends is what it's made of. This oh, is it landed in the Amazon. It, land, it landed in the Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can see from the ejecta, it was a high speed impact. Splash. Yeah, it just cleared it out, you know. This is a perfect opportunity to, to do another Halloween uh, 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 thing like the War of the Worlds, where you just say that the, uh, the, uh, the uh, orbit of Mars has been changed <laughs> by this uh -huh. asteroid, <laughs> and it's hurtling towards us. I'm sure yeah. some nutcase on the internet will do that. <laughs> uh, I'm sure it is, it's launched stuff into space, that some of which may end up on the Earth uh, in thousands of years. Well, if it streaks across the sky, it's a meteor. If it hits the Earth and we get it into Chuck's collection, it's a meteorite. What is a meteoroid? That's the thing that does it. Because a meteor is just the, um, the light phenomena that you see. It's not the actual particle. Yeah, I understand that. How, so the how, meteoroid is the particle. Do you suppose we're talking about a grain of sand that makes a, a flare that's many feet across? Is that possible? Not many feet across, it? but it's quite bright. Well, I know, but a little piece of sand makes that much yeah. fire and flame. Well, it ram heats the air in front of it, and the air fluoresces. Uh, but, I have I have a question here, uh, Chuck. I don't want to change it too much, but Chuck, you have uh, a, a a meteorite from Mars. Yeah, and I still don't understand how that got here. So that got here an impact. A grazing impact. I actually think they found the craters for some of these. Huh. A grazing impact uh, launched Threw it pieces of Mars into orbit, basically. You know, at a grazing impact with the lower gravity on Mars, you can you can easily knock stuff up into orbit. Okay. And then it was falling toward the Earth, and and uh, you know we got in the way. A couple of we don't know when this one landed, but it's called huh. Kyle Lehimir. Oh my God! It find its way here. That, that, yeah, that's that's just amazing. Well, it's falling toward the sun. You know, that's the easiest path to follow. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the sun sucks. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't NASA have a probe going around the sun called the Parker? Yeah, Parker yep. Solar Probe. What's the update on that? How close is it? Well, it it arches in and out. It's in an elliptical orbit. Oh, it is just like Juno and mm -hmm. and Cassini. If it's trying to stay close, it would cook itself to death well my thinking is if little particles going around our own earth would be so dangerous at seventeen thousand miles an hour imagine coming in close to the sun what's coming out of that sucker my god well it's not like the sun is blasting off rocks well it's, but there's, yeah. it's got everything going for it doesn't it uh protons and little pieces and like well, it's no, it's just atoms, just ions coming off of it. Well, the photons are the only thing going the speed of light. Everything. No, else... I mean ions, not photons. There, ions. Okay. Mm -hmm. Physical going... entities. Okay, it wouldn't come to Earth in eight minutes. Let here's me... here's the Parker Solar Probe. I'll be darn. Okay. That's called what kind of an orbit? Elliptical. 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 The sun is at one of the foci of that ellipse. 
So it's not a very accurate drawing. Okay, so we don't know how often it goes by the sun? Well, oh. that'll be in here. Oh, okay. It looks like it's quite a long period. What are they trying to find out that we can't learn 93 million miles away? Well, they're looking at the environment very close to the sun. Make up the solar wind and the, the uh, prominences and all that stuff. Supposedly the corona is even hotter than part of the- 100 degrees. Huh. And they've actually used the Parker probe and a couple of others to figure out why that is, what's accelerating those particles to the higher temperatures. Oh. And sort of a bunch of little mini flares that go off on the moon, mini magnetic reconnections. Right. On the sun, you mean? The sun, you on mean? On the sun, I yes. Yeah. Okay, September 6, 2022. <clears throat> oh, I was trying sorry. to get the period there, but yeah. Sorry, sorry about that. that. That's all right. It's it's fairly long period. But now this part, this it's part, this thir thirteenth time close to the sun. Yeah. Is it coming? Mm. Is it going to stay there, or is it going to plunge into the sun? No, it's going to stay in orbit. To stay doing that, huh? Yeah. Mercury. So I, don't, I don't know at end of mission what they're going to do. At end of mission, they might do something if they've got enough fuel. And it's sending back pictures, I assume. Data, yeah. Amazingly well lit pictures, I would imagine. <laughs> oh, the, oh, this is interesting. I wonder if there's a close fly, flyby of Mercury. Looks like this next pass. Nope. Well, they have different orbital periods, so just wait. Yeah, yeah. Mercury's in a little bit of an elliptical orbit, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's the most elliptical of all the orbits around the sun, except for maybe really? Pluto. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, if you plotted them over many years, it would look like a flower, like a large daisy. That Yeah, that's precession. Okay, yeah. It never goes the same route twice but then none of us do anyway we're moving through space look at that fascinating stuff where this we are this is the one of the the uh, solar heliophysics can see all these different uh, wavelengths coming off the sun oh, that's, that's a pretty neat. cool illustration yeah are those different elements and the basic uh, well they're the spectra from the very the same elements so they look different because the element, the spectra is not flat. Huh. Yeah, they're, they're looking at different parts of the spectrum, which are pro probably caused by different ions in there. Some, some of them, you know, a given element doesn't fluoresce at just one wavelength. It, it usually fluoresces at several. So a bunch of those will be hydrogen and some will be calcium. So these are not filtered. It's, they're actually looking at the different wavelengths and this is the colors of them? Well, they're, yeah. looking, they're using filters to look at the, very, the different wavelengths. Okay. They have a bunch of narrow bound filters on a big wheel that they can rotate and put in front of the camera. That's just think, like our bookmarks that we give out uh, this year the, from John Boyd it has three images of the sun through different you know. uh, hydrogen alpha and calcium yep. K. Yeah, the calcium K is it's like the blue in here. Yeah. But if our sun were a first stage, a uh, brand new star, we'd have very few of the elements, just hydrogen, helium, and whatever. Early in the universe, yes. But depends what it uh, was coalesced out of it. But yeah, like Chuck says, when the primordial universe formed, the dominant uh, element was hydrogen. But once stars got made and they went through their life and they blew up, right. and a lot of the, you know, the heavy elements were created, so that got scattered around. That's where we came from. We're not a first generation star. So you get all of the stuff that's above iron because of the supernovas. What we're looking at now is not a spectroscope or a spectroscopy. This is not the This spectrum. is, yeah, well, it's involved here. This is, this is a dynamic image of that same thing we just saw, the static one. Okay, but spectroscopes give you what little black lines representing different elements along a scale well, that's an absorption spectrum or you can have an emission spectrum which gives you bright lines okay that's just the light output versus wavelength this is uh light output in a band and it's you know the the uh, the, the z-axis the brightness is that how much of it there is as a function of area 
the and as you can see as a different colors scan over the background image of the sun how how it looks slightly different you can emphasize the plages around the the sunspots or the sunspots themselves or you see the prominences or you don't see the prominences hmm. well, the green you see a lot of the prominences yeah i think a lot of the uv images get colored green like that uh, in x-ray sometimes and that's just assigning a color so you can see it well, who come up with this? Parker? Is this from the Parker probe? Yeah. What we're looking at? Reminds well, me of this ac this actually is, I don't think this is the Parker one. Though. I think this is uh, Solar Dynamics ah, Observatory. SDL. Here on Earth. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, question for you guys. I, uh, I know this is kind of basic, but nevertheless, you know, Maunder Minimum, uh, where he tried to theorize a Sun-Earth connection to weather. Um, is do we know any more about that? Is there some kind of a sun earth connection, or are we going to be learning about this with these projects? Well, there's well, definitely a connection, climate. but it's it's not as severe as you know. You got these uh, climate change deniers that are claiming it's it's due to the solar cycles, mm. but it's not that dramatic. Yeah. Well, but, also the people that are, are uh, you know making big noise about the the temperatures increasing. It isn't right now. Or you know, it's been going down for the last twenty years or more. What? What? What temperature? The Earth's temperature. The no, that's temperature. absolutely false. It's completely really? wrong. Completely. That's false. Sounds like a Fox News broadcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't I, I think. <laughs> is there something like? Is the Earth uh, maybe uh, farther or, or an average from the sun right now? So maybe. That's why no. people say it should be cooler, no. but it's heating up because of the carbon dioxide. No. Or there's there's some variation of, uh, about the sun, or isn't there some seventy thousand year variation or something? Well, sunspots. The, the the number of sunspots has the what this Maunder minimum was I think kind of connecting the number of sunspots to uh, right. uh, many ice ages. Little ice age, yeah. That's right. But there, there's there's no established connection between those. So that that kind of fell through, didn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think we're going to be finding out a lot more about uh, the uh, solar, uh, especially going forward with energy. I think that it's going to probably be one of the predominant uh, things that we're going to be getting our energy from. Uh, one thing I'd really like to see a little bit more of is tidal energy, but huh. uh, I, I haven't heard anything of that. But uh, yeah, that salt metal. water is a really tough environment, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. I, I met a, I met a man back when I was going to sea on the breakwater, and he was actually just kind of stirring out at Leadbetter Point, and imagining how it would work. And he shared a couple of ideas with me. But you're right, the corrosive uh, element and the, the danger to the fish and everything is another. But it, it, it it's, it's something that you can do in the dark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this plot, I think, is the one to which I was referring. You notice the solar irradiance is going down. That's watts per square meter, the yellow curve. But the average temperature is going up. Yes, of the Earth. Of the Earth, right. Explain I'm, that away. That's no, carbon dioxide. That's radiative forcing. OK. Right, right. It's, even though the sun is dimming a bit, perhaps, it, the Earth is still getting warmer. So something else is going on. And that turns out to be carbon dioxide and methane and other uh, global warming gases that trap the heat on the earth. Yeah, right. a lot of people say, oh, water is a stronger car stronger um, greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, so why aren't we cooking? And it's, they interact with each other. When you have more carbon dioxide in the radiative forcing, you get more water vapor in the atmosphere, and that ends up, you know, multiplying the effect. It's a force multiplier in effect. Well, so does methane, so we ought to get rid of the cows. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Well, the major methane output, of course, is from from oil drilling, or or lack of controlling the leaks from oil drilling. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and now that we're heating up the tundra, you're getting bacterial um, decomposition of the peat or whatever it is that's up there, the plant elements, the biological material, and that's putting out a lot of methane. So yeah, all this stuff kind of reinforces. Mm -hmm. It's not a linear system. 
I don't know about you guys, but I'm looking forward to moving to the tropical beaches of Alaska and Greenland. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we'll have like a one acre plot at the North Pole where we can grow crops. <laughs> well, the North Pole is on on ice. It's above uh, yeah. 3,000 meters of water. Well, I the, heard uh, that, the, uh, that the, this is a joke, of course, but I heard that the, uh, you know how the Argentines claim an, a wedge of Antarctica? Um, it's supposed to be, you know, international, but they, they kind of claim a wedge of it. And the story was they were trying to show that that they had sovereignty there by being self-sufficient. So they, they planted sunflowers. And the problem was the sunflowers turned to face the sun and ended up drilling themselves down into the ground. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of your Mars based meteorites, they are mostly found in Antarctica, aren't they? Most meteorites these days are found in Antarctica, yeah. Because hmm. they don't get swallowed up by the Earth, they get entombed in ice. Yeah. Right? Well, and the they ice show up really well in the ice. Yeah. Uh, but the ice there doesn't keep turning around in the, Ar in, the Ar in the Arctic. The ice is fluid. It moves. You know, the surface melts, flows yeah. off. You get, you get these big rock piles up in the Arctic where the uh, rocks don't move, but the ice does. So the ice is turning itself over and over and over again all the time. And it deposits the uh, meteorites. Didn't a big chunk of ice uh, break off from Antarctica about the size of Connecticut? or? Yeah, a while back, yeah. Holy, whoa, man. Could solve our water problems if it floated here. <laughs> oh, wow. Here we go. Rocks are us. Is it the world famous McPartland collection? No, not here. Oh, my goodness. Older than dirt. We had a neighbor across the street, Helmut. He went down to Antarctica and then they named a, a mountain after him, one of the many mountains there. He got a na his name on Air Inspect, I think it was called. Wow. Well, the soft stuff we dig into here on Earth is dirt, and that's composed mainly of past animal life on mars what's the soft stuff that they dig into well, it's a lot of it's mineral stuff ron dirt dirt is silicates but there's there's no uh nothing life or lifelike or oh well of course right? in soil that you're going to want to grow stuff in there's a, an organic component but it's mostly silicates it's it's iron, iron, right? silicates and Iron? Maybe a good mix of nickel, a good mix of iron to get that nice red color. A lot of the stuff that comes, we get, I've forgotten how many tens of tons of uh, meteorite dust falls in the earth every day. It's but like 50 what, to 100 tons, something like that. Yeah, that's, that's what buries the ancient, you know, ruins and everything else. <laughs> it's not. Don't dust your coffee table. It's valuable stuff. Yeah. Did <laughs> you guys for a second see my Halloween costume? I think it's here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> going to Sergeant Garcia. Oh, very good. Oh, okay. <laughs> Who's going to be Zorro? <laughs> Karen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. There's the, your backyard. Oh, man. That's 2014 with the Curiosity. Oh, wow. Looking back the soil. at the tracks. Oh, there's a oh, dust storm. Uh, there's a dust storm. Yeah. Wow. And let's We're see what's this say very here. Atmosphere, it certainly is active. <clears throat> so, so sodium oxide, magnesium oxide, aluminum oxide, silicate, uh, sil silicon dioxide, potassium. What's that? Potassium something. Potassium and a lot of oxygen. Yeah. Don't wanna. Uh, or is that phosphate? Don't wanna add water something? to that. <laughs> They're worried about something about was it chlor uh, was it not chlorates or something chlorine? No, well, it, it was, was some kind of chlorates. Poor chlorate, yeah. And that may be Which, what that is. Yeah, well, that's, that's an oxidizer yeah. from rocket fuel. But there's chlorine by itself, yeah. and and they're getting, it looked like they're getting these three different uh, uh, rovers, Spirit, Opportunity, and Curiosity, are all kind of getting the same kind of uh, balance of composition. Oh, well, I think that's the whole point of this graph. Yeah. Here's iron oxide. Yeah. The three yeah. colors involved here don't stand for anything individually. Right there in the right. graph, Ron. Yeah. 
I'm trying to the three, the three, the three rovers, spirit, opportunity, and curiosity. So they have, they've all done an analysis oh. of the soil, evidently, and they're all coming up with uh, very similar compositions. I see. Got you right. Spread by the wind. <laughs> but this is a scooper on curiosity. And that's, that's nice. is that the surface right there, or is that uh, yeah. in the lab? That's the surface. Oh my it's, God! It's, it's sifting, sifting a load of sand. So, uh, did it shake it to sift it, or what? <clears throat> Must well, be. It, it looks awfully fine. So it, I wouldn't, uh, you know, it, it'd be interesting to put your bare feet on that. <laughs> in more ways than one. <laughs> one not that you get your foot back, but it'd be, well, it'd be, is do it, it in the sun. Is it curiosity or is it perseverance that's going to leave the samples for pickup later? That's curiosity. Oh, wow. Look at that. Oh no, that pure perseverance is leaving oh, samples yeah. for later. Perseverance, yeah. the latest one. I keep mixing them up. Yeah. And ingenuity is the little helicopter. You suppose it's out every day. Flight you have those scanning to determine where they shouldn't go. They're actually well, talking about making a, a more robust uh, helicopter and using that to pick up the samples that Perseverance is leaving behind. Because earlier they had talked about a rover that would kind of follow in its tracks and go to the spots where it dumps stuff. But it'd be much easier to just go with a helicopter and collect it and bring it back to a rover that was or, or a lander that was just sitting in one spot. A lot less chance of it getting stuck, too. Yeah. Well, if they design it, they got to get it there. That's going to take a little while. I wonder if they're going to do anything. You know, one of the big problems with the rovers is the dust covering the solar panels and cutting down their efficiency. I'm wondering if they're going to do anything to try to ameliorate that problem. Well, that's why Perseverance and Curiosity have the uh, plutonium source. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So what Nobody happened here? Look, they drilled into down. the soil, and it actually lifted up the surrounding uh, rock. Wow. Oh. When they pulled it out? Yeah. yeah. Oh, maybe, maybe. Yeah, when they pulled it out, for sure, Tom. Looks like it cracked. And it looked like they were after that water ice. Uh, analyzing that, yeah. You suppose every uh, element known to man is on Mars somewhere? Oh, probably not really obscure stuff that we've created in labs. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. I, I, right. Where, where does nature stop? What number? Uranium? Uh, no, they found plutonium um, and stuff, but they're rare, 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 you know. Yeah. Now, what is this? Like a, this is a tattoo. <laughs> so it says dust devils cause twisting dark trails on the Martian surface. Ah, there's a Halloween. Dust. There's a Halloween <laughs> candy for you. <laughs> well, the surface gets bleached due to the ultraviolet light. And when the dust devil removes that very thin surface layer, you see what's underneath. Yeah. Wow. We'll, we'll see that there. It's just, that's an amazing image right there gets a, uh, bleached also by gamma rays and things like that well, does anybody know who's landed on mars other than us everybody else is just orbiting aren't they china china china, china made it. landed china did land okay oh did the british have a successful one or is that the one that crashed and the... that's the one that crashed <laughs> well, what is this Oh, they're showing location, opportunity, curiosity in 2012. And that, this is a dust storm probably here. What are the black streaks? Uh, just Where they didn't have a photograph. Yeah. yeah. It's a collage. Huh. Yeah. It looks like they just stitched it all together. Right. Well, they were showing the size of a dust storm increasing or something. Well, this is before and after a dust storm, 2018. Does Mars gets a, a lot brighter when it's got a dust storm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, got, it's actually quite bright now if you get out and take a look at it. Yeah, I think that's two in the morning. No, it's up by nine o'clock. Yeah. So oh, okay. that's true. Where we were going, where we are on Friday, there was enough uh, low stuff around us that we couldn't see the horizon. Oh, wow. Look at that. You mean a dust Mars, storm? It affects 2001. The Mars Global Surveyor. 
The whole planet gets a dust storm? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, occasionally. Wow. With 1% of our atmosphere. Yep. And is there oxygen in that 1% and all the other gases that are in ours? There's a, there's a little bit of oxygen. Mainly carbon dioxide, isn't it? Yeah, it's mostly carbon dioxide. Yeah. Would this make good fertilizer on your lawn? <laughs> Looks like coffee oh. grounds. Oh, that actually they found a barbecue rub there. <laughs> Looks like a table. They have an Easter Island on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> Pull that out of your chicken tongue. Oh yeah, how about that? <laughs> Just the heads though. <laughs> Looks like Mickey Mouse, yeah. So the red is rust, right? It's iron making Mars the red planet. Yeah. Yes. Are these, the are these the blueberries that they found? No, those oh, actually wow. are quite blue and, and very round, the magnetite. Blueberries. Got, somehow they got rounded by water? Yeah. Really? Oh. And wind. <laughs> different, different rockness. And here's a trail that tracks... Is it, is it spelling out JPL there? Can... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No more stone. <laughs> oh, yeah. That, that was really great. It's too bad we didn't have these pictures 100 years ago for H.G. Wells and Orson. There you can see, you can see that uh, Morse code on the, on the wheel there at the bottom. Oh, yeah, there it is right there. It says the, made in the, China. The JPL guy that came to a, a meeting one time told us that, that NASA was being pretty nasty about putting NASA on everything and so they, they got back by putting Morse code JPL on the tires. <laughs> that was really great. Well, it's showing us sand shifting on Mars. That's cool. Yeah. Really? Well, that's just, just under a tire here. Yeah. So it didn't no. move for a day. So that, that must have happened just within a day or two. <clears throat> well, they sit, they sit quite long at some places, so... Not very long. Oh, well, it's one day. It's one Earth day. Oh, it is. Judging okay, yeah. from the text at the bottom, yeah. So here's another one for you guys. Is it the, the the theories I read was that Mars some it had a, it had an atmosphere, and that it was stripped of the atmosphere because it it didn't have the uh, magnetism. Lost its magnetic, magnetic field. field. Yeah. It didn't have the magnetic field, and some people were even. <laughs> saying that it's kind of like what could happen to the earth what could happen to the earth but th that's our true. future if the core you know cools down oh i see okay and the core is great you know the core is going to cool down yeah but there's no there's really nothing like in the, the sci-fi movies that you can do <laughs> to recreate a, an atmosphere on mars you well know, uh, i'm sorry tim to interrupt you here's a nice star trek oh yeah, oh well. there you go <laughs> since you mentioned yeah, science fiction yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, yeah, there's there's talk about putting a big nuclear generated uh, magnetic field, nuclear power generated magnetic field thing in orbit uh, ahead of, you know, between the sun and Mars and and protecting it that way. But it'd take huge amounts of power. Yeah, how many petawatts would that take? <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't want to see you wouldn't want to see that failed launch. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you need an awful big <clears throat> rocket. You're talking a lot of weight, a whole lot of weight. Unless they can get fusion going. Uh, when at we were talking. Point, at this point, ahead, plexiglass. <laughs> what were you saying there, uh, Tim? Well, I, I was going to mention, we were talking about the uh, climate on Earth a little earlier in, in last week's uh, program on Bill Maher, he had a guy on there that was saying that we have the technology now uh, to do something about our, our uh, global warming, but that the earth as a whole would have to, to they'd have to pitch in like 2%, 2 to 3% of their uh, annual uh, uh, income. But if the earth did it as a whole, they could actually reverse this climate. Uh, this uh, what? What is warming. this proposed technology? Yeah, I I don't know, Chuck. But he said that he history. 
but uh, I, I didn't, I didn't know them. But the guy read a book. I, he wrote a book. I'm going to try to find out more about it. But I mean, it's said, carbon sequester, but it's it's very power intensive. Oh, the uh, thing that take in carbon out of the air. Yeah, I I think it, it was it was more his point was that that we have the technology and if we had the willingness to do it, we could change it. But what's lacking right now is the, is a global willingness to do something about it. And so it's yeah, going to well, just be yeah, a, nobody wants to change their life. It's a problem. Yeah. It's all this amount of money. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so the thing's just going to keep spiraling, I suppose. And it's, that's not a, not a good thing, but you know, like, like I was discussing with my wife a couple of times, they they really, this thing about getting into solar energy and wind energy and all that, that's really a good thing. That's a real good thing. Yeah. All right. So, so well, the, the day biggest that change that created that uh, has reduced carbon dioxide emissions in our atmosphere is changing from coal and oil to natural gas in the power plants. Oh, uh, that's, that's that's greenwashing by the, the natural gas companies. They say cleaner well, burning. I, well, the things I was seeing, you know, the, the percentage of uh, power that's created by wind and, and solar and all that stuff is down in the low percentages. The dominant part is comes from the power generation plants, which have now switched over by and large to natural gas. We've got lots of natural gas. But still that's yeah, carbon dioxide, which it produces the carbon dioxide. So it's not a solution. It, it, it no, may, be, may help coal, in the interim to make things a little bit cleaner than coal, but we've got to wean ourselves off that. And, and the trend in the, in the cost for, for solar and renewables has been going down at a great rate. And um, it's it, we got to stop letting these. The trouble is, these big carbon companies have lots and lots of money to spend to create these astroturf grassroots groups, supposedly that say, "Oh, well, we can solve our problems with natural gas or with or even with fission power," which is like it's because the oil companies know that fission power is very slow to come online, hugely expensive, and dangerous. So we're not going to do it. And so they're mm -hmm. they're trying to stretch out the amount of time that they're sucking money out of the populace. Yeah, and the idea of cold fusion is just I mean that that's just not going to happen I don't think. That would sure be nice, but yeah, that but would be real nice. coming, you know, fusion well, it seems to always be 50 years in the future, but it is making progress. Uh, we had that guy that spoke at our uh, club that one year Chuck remember that he was saying, "Well, we got something coming down the pike that you're going to hear about next year." That was 10 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, so it's, it, but it would change everything. Well, it's like so, trying to, you know, compress to hold on to the sun. You know, it's like trying to put the sun in a bottle and, and extract the energy. So it's a mm -hmm. tough problem. Yeah. Yep. 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 So, so Ron, what's, what's our next speaker coming up Friday? All right. I guess we better shut this down after Halloween gets cooking. His name is Rory Bentley and he's a, a UC grad student, UCLA. Once again, and um, then we're going to try to, I guess, uh, in the next meeting from now, let's see, it'll be December, and we're going to try to meet live, are we not, at Farron Hall on the campus? That's the thought at this point. And <laughs> if, if we do, I've got my, it's, I got my it's going to be a hybrid meeting. It's going to be a combination of live and uh, YouTube. Okay. That's going to be, that's going to be oh. interesting. For people who don't feel comfortable coming and sitting in Farron Hall, they'll be able to tune into YouTube and see it. So we're going to have uh, probably Tom Totten on a camera in the back and a big screen. I think Chrissy. Showing all of us on the screen above and behind that counter. Well, thing. It'll just be showing the speaker who will be there. And I don't know if he'll be there in fair and he'll probably who, who's our speaker for December. Uh, it'll be you guys, you and Jerry. Oh, that's right. That's right. It's the me. It's the members night in the meeting. So we'll be speaking in fair and uh, then it'll just be beamed out onto, onto YouTube. All right, I could use another speaker. That's 20 minutes each for a good hour. So any of you gentlemen feel like taking on a topic and making it understandable, you'd be more than welcome. Oh, that last part, making it understandable. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think you're, welcome. you're welcome. Jerry, <clears throat> President Jerry is going to be talking about building his telescope or his little observatory in his house. Oh, that's cool. Chuck doesn't think we want to see him, but uh, I, anything Chuck does is awesome to watch. So maybe Agreed. Fun, maybe you, Bruce, one of you guys at the bottom of my screen, come up with a 20-minute thing that'll dazzle us. 
Otherwise, we'll be gathered on the screen again next week. Have a happy dispensing of candy. And if you're giving out Reese's peanut butter cups, I'll be there at your door tonight. Uh, yeah. Actually, right. we've, we've got to give out Mars bars and, you know, Milky Ways and things like that. <laughs> one, la one last thing, Ron. What's that? For Tom, for Tom Whittemore, I was up at Westmont. Ken Kelstrom has got that dome working. Everything up there is working, Tom. So as far as I know, uh, the last couple of tries he's done with the with the big scope, it's it's working okay. Okay, well we're all gonna get uh, I guess sourdough bread for Christmas from you know who. <laughs> <laughs> Take care of yourselves and thank you. Keep all right, guys. All right, take care. Thanks. Take care. Bye bye. Thanks, Ron. Bye bye. bye.